Langelke of the University of Alabama, and uh, he will be talking to us about detecting large-scale traveling ionospheric disturbances using feature recognition and amateur radio data. Okay, thanks, Diego. Thanks, Francis. All right, good afternoon. Um, we're talking a lot about using spot data uh, today to do various things. Uh, this is one of them. Um, first, uh, a quick reminder, or anybody who's not familiar with this, we have these things called TIDs, uh, transient ionospheric disturbances. These are electron density waves that propagate through the ionosphere and affect HF propagation. You see this manifested in QSB uh, fading, and um, there can be large scale, which are like one to four hours in period, and medium scale. And there's a lot of other things that go on, but these are the, the ones of, that we focus on a little bit today. You can actually see these waves traveling when you look at data from PSK, RBN, and Whisper. So I developed a new technique to recognize these using machine learning. Sorry. Okay, okay. Um, <clears throat> there are a variety of ways to spot TIDs. Um, we've talked about some of them today. Uh, we've talked about ionosons and um, GNSS, looking at TEC data. One of the ones that uh, Nathaniel has worked a lot with is using HF radar and in particularly the Virginia Tech Super Darn HF radar. Um, you can see here uh, in this little illustration here um, the coverage of the Blackstone radar, and it has different beams. Beam 4 sweeps across a large portion of the U.S. and Canada, and it, you can get uh, um, plots of the ground scatter and since the ground isn't moving, when, with it, when this moves, it means the ionosphere moves. So you can see these kind of little shapes that occur in the radar data tend to be sine waves or portions of sine waves, and you can verify that they are large-scale or LSTIDs uh, when you see them between one to four hours. So why bother looking at spot data for this? Um, well, we don't have HF radars everywhere in the world. We have a lot more hams than we have uh, super darn systems. And we also don't have the super darn system being up 100% of the time, whereas hams are pretty much always out there trying to make QSOs. Um, so we think it's, we can make a contribution to ionospheric science by taking a look at how this propagation is occurring uh, and having a richer data source. So, um, as mentioned by other um, presenters, we're using Whisper, RBN, and PSK Reporter, although I will say my first attempt at doing this, I consider a proof of concept and uses only the PSK data um, because it takes a long time to process these, these huge data files. Uh, like, for example, just, just PSK, it's three gigabytes of data per day that you have to work with. Uh, and PSK data is the richest of the data sources as of today, uh, being ten times, more than ten times uh, more data than the nearest, closest other data source. So how do we represent spot data in such a way that we can compare it to uh, super darn data? Um, we're going to look at 
the, uh, on the x-axis, UTC 1200 to 2400. Uh, we're going to look at 20 meters, and that's when 20 meters is open over North America. And on the y-axis, we're going to use the same axis as we use for the Super Darn plots, uh, 0 to 3,000 kilometers, and uh, that, that gives us coverage of most of North America. And I plot uh, this, a, uh, a plot such that the color of the spot is proportional to the number of spots in that minute at that range. So you can see as the, as the band opens up uh, during the day and, oh look, look at the shape at the bottom of this. I uh, wonder if that could be a TID. Um, and you know, you've, you've got, sometimes you've got multi-hop things going on so you can see some hops, uh, some TIDs embedded in this at different ranges. Um, so this is directly comparable to the um, super darn data. Now here's an example where I took a day where you see to have a very clear TID embedded in the super darn data. If we look at the data from PSK, we have a corresponding shape. Of it. You can even see these little MSTIDs embedded in here. You see a little bit of that in here as well. So you can definitely see a TID in the PSK data. Um, there's another thing I have spotted in some of this PA, PSK data. Um, Nathaniel has named these PEPs, PEP, Periodic Enhanced Propagation, uh, where you have uh, a few minutes here where five or 10 minutes of very highly enhanced propagation um, in this band and then it fades away, and then it comes back again, then it fades away and comes back again. We don't know what these are. We don't even really know for sure whether this is actual propagation or processing artifacts. Um, I've been encouraged to look at other data sources. Um, uh, so far, I haven't found these in other data sources because the other data sources, that is RBN and Whisper, are not as dense as this to be able to see this. So one of the things we're going to be looking at is trying to figure out why we see these repeating um, what's, what looks like periodic enhancements in propagation. But that's kind of at cross, cross angles with the discussion about using machine learning. What are we doing as far as machine learning? I'm using something called TensorFlow. You might have heard of it. It was originally developed by Google and it's now been turned over to open source and is maintained by a, an army of volunteers. Uh, there are many different models for doing various different kinds of things. They ha this originally des was developed uh, for doing a recognition of handwriting using automated techniques, and now is, is a general object detection model, which you can train to look for whatever you want to find in an image. So the idea is I go through a, a whole bunch of of pictures of the propagation um, using PSK and identify those places when in each plot where there is a TID and train the, sin the system to look for those. So you need to have several thousand images. Um, I used for the training 2016 through 2019, which gives four years of data, and I've noticed well, obviously, you don't have TIDs in every single day, but then on the days when there are TIDs, very often you can spot multiple TIDs in a given image on the same day. So you take your images and you split them randomly into 80% training and 20% test. That is for the training. So out of our four years of data, we split our training data 80 and 20. Then we go through the images manually and mark the features we want the system to look for. So for example, here we have a, an example where there is clear TIDs. So we say, all right, we got TIDs in this picture. We can see where they are. We know what they look like. We're going to use a program called Label Image, Label IMG. Uh, it's a Python program which allows you to draw little boxes around those things that you want the system to consider something of interest. Um, the, the way you learn how to do this is a tutorial on, on training a system to look for and identify different playing cards out of a pinochle deck. So you can have it to, to look for anything. So we, I went through and identified as many TIDs as I could find for these four years worth. 
Then you run these through a training program. The way it does is it, it takes and applies the training model to a, an object detection model and adjusts it and uh, compares its result to see if it finds the comparable TIDs in the training images. Uh, and it adjusts the model and adjusts and adjusts and adjusts until it eventually gets down the loss, which means the difference between what it, it finds and what it should have found. And then uh, it, it gradually goes down towards zero. You don't want to get exactly to zero, which would indicate overtraining. Um, so the output of the training run is an object detection model. And I must mention, if you're going to do this, Go through some effort if you have to to get your system running with the GPU because it tr cuts your training time by 80 to 90 percent. Uh, running the training on this four years of data still took the system six or eight hours, even running with the GPU at running a wide open. So how do we use this object detection model? Now that we have the system knowing what it's looking for, uh, we use the detector program. It looks at new images, images that were not in the training or test set. So now we're looking at, at images that I took for the year 2020 and 2021. Um, so here is an example of uh, from the year 2020, December 9th. Um, we can, you could see that, that there's something here that could perhaps be a, a TID. And uh, sure enough, the system uh, draws an area around this area and it, it scores 100% confidence. Now, 100% confidence is awfully high and seems kind of suspicious, but in this case, um, it's probably because what, we've, what we see in the image is very similar to something in one of the training models. So um, it, it does work. It, it does find them. Um, uh, if we look at the super darn image for the same day, we do see TIDs in it. So it is correct. It did find it. Um, this is another interesting case here. Um, if you look at this image, it looks pretty flat on the bottom. It's not clear to the human eye that there is a TID in this, although the system says that there is. Uh, really? Um, it's only 97% confidence, which is still a pretty high confidence level. If we look at the data for that day in SuperDarn, yes, it's, it's the TIDs that are in the very bottom a slightly less or around one hour uh, period time. So indeed, it found it. Uh, so what's interesting about this is sometimes it can find a TID in an image when it's not even clear to the human eye that that TID is there. So um, what are we going to do next? Um, I want to redo the training with more years of data. So uh, maybe get six or set, maybe six years worth of data and um, then also include data from Whisper and RBN as well as PSK so that we can get a little richer training set. What are we going to do then? Um, the idea next is to apply the object detection system to historical data. Um, climatology. What we can do is we can go through and analyze all the images for years and start looking at um, how, how does the number of TIDs uh, correspond to the time of the year and to other things like other things like various solar and geomagnetic factors? Uh, and then perhaps this could lead to an improved understanding of TIDs, what drives them. And in, in fact, um, you know, there's a, some feeling that TIDs could be related to various meteorological factors, the polar vortex, and um, uh, storms and things like this, if we can have a, a really good inventory of all the TIDs and when they occur, uh, we, it may be possible to do some correlational analysis to some of these other factors. So that's the plan going forward. All right, so um, thanks to NASA for a couple of grants that assisted in funding this work. And also thanks to the Super Darn team, uh, various different locations, particularly at uh, Virginia Tech, who developed the software for doing the plotting and provided the data uh, for the, um, for, uh, the North, North American data. So that is that concludes the presentation. Uh, I don't know if we have do we have any time for any questions. Okay, we're out of time. All right.
Go ahead. Does the problem scale? Good. Does the problem scale linearly or nonlinearly with the size of the data? I don't really know the answer to the question um, because what I've done so far is a proof of concept with the data I have at hand. Um, so because of the way machine learning works, it might be able, it might be sensitive enough to find patterns even in much sparser data than what I have been using. So I suspect, I suspect just kind of intuitively based on the way machine learning works, that it's probably nonlinear, but that's one of those things that really you're only gonna know it if you try it. So that's a, that's a good thing to study. So I guess I need to conclude here because we are out of time for this presentation, all right?